Kia ora everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in to today's webinar. This is my first time giving a webinar and giving it from the comfort of my bedroom, which is quite comfy. Um, so we're talking about ecosystem models that we've developed. So we have three ecosystem models that we've developed at NEWA into sustainable seas. And they vary in complexity. They vary in how long they take to put together and they vary in the uses that they're best used for. Um, so it's a bit of a roadmap before we get into this. Um, first, I'm going to give you a bit of a background into ecosystem modeling, why we do ecosystem modeling, and kind of a bit about what they are. So this will be um, familiar territory to lots of our listeners, but it might be helpful for some as well. Then we'll talk a bit about each of the three ecosystem models at, in turn. So first I'll talk about the Atlantis model. Um, then Adele will talk about the EcoPath with ecosystem model. And then Samik will talk about our science space model. Following that, we'll have a look at some comparisons between the three models in response to historical fishing, uh, both at the individual species group level and at the ecosystem level. Then after that, we'll look at um, the types of scenarios that each of the ecosystem models are best used for and what makes them better used for different scenarios than the others. And after that, as Charlotte said, we'll have the question and answer session. So some background for the ecosystem models. <clears throat> so generally the ecosystem models that we are talking about are mathematical models. So they're defined first using uh, mostly differential equations like the one that you can see on that picture there. They're designed to capture sort of key dynamics of the system. They're going to be simpler than the real world, so we're not going to have all the dynamics in there. And the general idea is to capture sort of the main gist of what's of the aspects of the system that we want to look at. So with the model being simpler than reality, well, we also have full control of the model and we also have full transparency. So we can change the model world and we can also see how it responds. So we can do things like increasing primary productivity, decreasing fishing pressure, increasing temperature, we can run the model forward in time or back in time, combinations of these, and we can explore the model outputs in various different time frames or dimensions or combinations of these. So with being able to really push and pull these model levers, then we can gain an understanding of the dynamics and the flow and effects from the system. We can use this next step to then relate the results from the model world back to the real world. But because the model is an, an abstraction of reality, then relating the results that we get from the model world back to the real world are going to be not as straightforward as some people always realize. And so then we need to think about what were those key dynamics that we were capturing in the first place and use those to help us understand what those results are actually going to tell us. What the key dynamics are, Will depend a bit about the on the uh, system that we're exploring and also on the type of questions that we're wanting to know. So it can be tempting when we develop a model to try and put everything imaginable into it, everything under the sun. So then the model can do everything that we might ever want to do with it. Um, but to put that together will take quite a long time and also before we can use it, we need to be able to test it, validate it and understand it, and that will take even longer. And we have end-to-end uh, -end ecosystem models such as Atlantis, which do come pretty close to modeling everything under the sun. It's impossible in an Atlantis model to model everything from sunlight to market and everything in between, including flow and effects and feedback loops. But even in an Atlantis model, we're still looking at simplifications. For example, we define the species in the system by species functional groups. We define it spatially by a fairly coarse structure of polygons and depth layers. And we simplify the oceanographic variables, such as temperature, salinity, and water movement, to the spatial scale and the temporal scale of the model. When developing the model, it's important to think about what aspects of the system we need to capture and replicate. If it is a model to explore ecosystem effects of fishing, then we'll need to have the fish species in there and we'll possibly also want fleets in there so we can explore 
some fishing behavior or fleet dynamics. If it's a system with a lot of migration, then we want some means of capturing that, whether that's directly or through proxies. And if it's a system where the benthic habitat is changing or has changed, then we might want to model that can incorporate that. For some dynamics, we might model them explicitly, although that might be that proxies can be used as well. For example, migration can be modeled explicitly with the animals actually leaving the system and then returning at a later date. This can be helpful, especially if they leave the system to, to um, reproduce, to spawn, or whether they leave the system for feeding grounds. But you can also do a lot of this with proxies by reducing their presence in the food web dy dynamics. This latter part takes the angle that if the proportion of the population are outside of the model system, then they are getting only a proportion of their food from in the system, and only a proportion of the biomass are available to predators in the system. So through this proxy, we can get effectively the same dynamics, but in a much simpler way. Similarly with the spatial dynamics, the Atlantis model, for example, models space explicitly using polygons and depth layers, whereas the EcoPath with EcoSim and the size-based models use an availability term to account for the spatial distributions. For example, if a predator and prey don't fully overlap spatially in the raw system, then you can set the proportion of the prey available to a given predator as being less than 100%. However, if we wanted a scenario to explore feedback loops, then we might need to explicitly model the dynamic of interest. For example, if the habitat provided refuge, providing refuge to a given prey group is actually uh, food to another species group in the model, then with everything being connected and somewhat complex, it's conceivable for a, for a dynamic within the prey group that's getting refuge from the habitat. If the dynamics of that population change, it's possible for that to then feed back through the rest of the system that then results in a change to its own um, habitat. So the, the feedback loops and the flow on effects are not also always uh, foreseeable. And that's one of the reasons why you might put more explicit dynamics in the model to learn from those dynamics than what you would do from having them as proxies. The tool part of the um, exploring and learning and decision curve. The temporal scale is also important to consider with respect to dynamics. If it's important that we capture seasonal dynamics, for example, such as phytoplankton blooms or spawning events, migration timings, frequency of storm events, and the combinations of these, then we'll want a finer scale than yearly, for example. If we want a very um, focused model on nutrient dynamics, then we might want a finer scale yet than even daily or hourly. So as you can, uh, where Charlotte said in the intro, I developed the Atlantis model. So the bits of my talk are probably weighted towards the Atlantis model. Uh, this was the model that we developed first, uh, and the other two models have been developed to use the inputs from the Atlantis model as well, so that they're kind of mimics of the Atlantis model, but in a simpler way, so we can really learn about how the structure is affecting how these represent the system. So when we first defined the Atlantis model, we defined the spatial structure. I had a colleague in Nelson, Sean Handley, did a bioregionalization of the Tasman Golden Bays. And that came out with, I think at that stage it was 15 polygons. We also considered, and that was based on salinity and dissolved organic nitrogen. We also looked at the historical fishing footprint and combined with those, we came out with 25 dynamic polygons, which you can see in this figure here. In addition to these, we also have a boundary polygon, which flanks the northern edge there. So the boundary polygon is, uh, allows for water movement, nutrients and animals into and out of the model area. All the polygons are further divided into depth layers, which were set at 10, 20, 35, 50, and 65 plus meters. For the shallower polygons that you can see around the coast there, with the darker colors, having uh, potentially only one depth layer, and the deeper polygons having potentially the full five depth layers. 
the temporal scale for the Atlantis model was set at 12 hour time steps. And we'll get to that in a moment. The next step was to define the oceanographic variables. So we used outputs from a regional oceanographic modeling system model of the Tasman Golden Bays developed by Mark Hadfield. And that the variables that we took from that were for uh, sea temperature and salinity and water movement. So those ended up being summarized at the scale of the polygons and the depth layers that we have in the bays and at the scale of the 12 hour time steps. And we can see in this, hopefully our animation will come through in a moment. Here we go. So uh, this animation here shows you the sea surface temperature from the ROMS model, from which we took the variables to inform the Atlantis model. So you can really get a feel here for the dynamic nature of the waters in the bays. So we've got temperatures ranging from hot red at 23 degrees to cool dark blue at 8 degrees. If you're familiar with the bays, you can see why Tohuna Beach is such a great place to swim in summer. There we go, this nice red bit around here. And then during winter, when we get to that in a moment, you'll see that cool water, river water flows really cool down the surface temperature around the edges there. So Atlantis actually uses an adaptive time step for things that have a higher rate of change, such as uh, nutrients and microzooplankton. But for the rest of the system, it uses the 12 hour time steps that allow for differences in day and night. We wanted finer scale resolution around the estuaries um, and wanted to capture the tides, then we probably want to make that finer than 12 hours. From a species perspective, the Atlantis model uses 51 groups to represent the biological processes. Five of these species groups are bacteria or detritus, eight are plankton or algae, 15 are ver invertebrates and 23 are vertebrates. Of these groups, 15 of them comprise of single species. And these are either very abundant like barracuda or seagrass or sufficiently distinct to warrant their own group like fur seals. Or they're important for us to investigate such as snapper or scallop. Other groups with multi-species combine organisms with broadly similar form, habitat, and diet. For example, small pelagics are grouped together, or gelatinous zooplankton, or zooplankton, or shorebirds. Any ecosystem model also needs a currency, some consistent unit of exchange to allow us to track the transfer of energy throughout the system. Some models use carbon as the currency or oxygen or calories. Atlantis uses nitrogen because as well as being a nutrient that we can track, it's also potentially limiting in marine resources. The nutrient cycle is complex, cyclical and continuous. Microorganisms in most invertebrate groups are modeled as single biomass pools where the proportion of nitrogen in the total biomass is calculated. Commercial invertebrates and vertebrates are modeled as individuals. So we track the number of individuals as well as the average weights per individual. Further, we track their weights as um, we split that between the reserved weight and the structural weight, where the reserved weight is more susceptible to changes due to food availability. So they will starve effectively, that will change the reserved weight. And that has flown effects to their spawning success. Eventually, every um, so the food webs are very complex and very key, of course, to the model and requires a lot of um, assumptions and generalizations. Some of the species groups that we have in the model, we have very good diet data for and some of them less so. The same uh, diet assumptions were used in all three models, although um, at a, in a slightly different way. Which my colleagues will get to soon. And the Atlantis model, it's nitrogen that's transferred up the food chain to other species, such as pelagic fish, filter feeders, demersal fish, bottom scavengers, sharks, birds, seals, 
and eventually all of the organisms in the days is carrying and detritus ready to provide nitrogen and microorganisms to fuel the cycle over again. Because this model is likely to be used to help explore and understand implications of alternative fishing scenarios, we've structured the fisheries using fleets that reflect the range of fisheries fishing practices carried out in the bays. The main fishery in terms of Thames Court has been the trawl fishery since the mid 20th century. Those are the um, mid blue bars. And prior to this dredging and surf dredging, both targeting gullets, mussels and oysters were more dominant and these fisheries featured again in the late 1980s through to mid 2000s. There's also a strong recreational fishery which extends back to the start of the model in 1900 with the top rec species being snapper, kawai, followed by tilakihi, cod and spiny dogfish. So that's a brief overview of the Atlantis model for the Tasman and Golden Bays and I'll pass on to Adele and then Samit who will talk about the EcoPath with EcoSim and then the size-based models and then I'll come back to you for comparing the three models. Hello, um, I'm just going to take control of the screen so I can show you what I'm talking about. Um, okay. There we go. So um, the EcoPath with EcoSim food web model was um, developed based on the date, same data that was available to the Atlantis model. Um, the EcoPath part of this model links the production of one group with the consumption of all other groups. So this, um, the requirements of the EcoPath mass balance model is that the production from one group um, must end up somewhere else in the system, whether it be by, um, through fishing catches, migration, predation, mortality, etc. So the EcoPath model must ensure that the energy inputs and outputs for each of the functional groups um, is balanced. So in other words, we have to estimate what losses, um, the losses of production through consumption. So here consumption is defined as the sum of production respiration and any unassimilated food or whatever ends up being available to detrital groups. Um, the second part of the model is the ecosim part. So ecosim is then used to simulate different responses like changes in fishing on the system that was balanced previously in the ecopath part. Um, the way that ecosim simulates different responses is um, through observing changes in feeding interactions between the different functional species groups. Um, on this particular screen, we've got an example for red gurnard as the output from this model. So the outputs from ecosim in this first panel here shows the changes in biomass over time. In the blue dotted line is what's estimated by the model and there's I don't know if you can see it, but there's a very faint blue line just underneath it, which is the observed um, the observed biomass trends that we get from stock assessment models and the like. Um, the, you get different changes in the consumption over biomass. So um, as a particular prey is being consumed, whether by um, predation or any other mortality and being removed from the system, um, the biomass goes down. You can also see the interactions with the uh, predators. So the predation mortality decreases as there are fewer red gurnard for predators to prey upon. And each, pre each predator has a different level of um, predation on this particular prey species. You can also see the if the impacts on the percentage of prey that are um, that are predated upon by red gurnard 
so as and their dynamics so as the percentage of um, as the biomass of red gurna decreases, the percentage of certain prey items are being released. So the pressure is being released, so their biomass index indices go up. Um, so we can simulate different um, different responses from fishing to different management um, responses to different environmental effects. Um, although when it comes to some simulations they need to be in terms of proxies for example if you have land-based effects you would have such as increases in sediment sedimentation you would model these as changes in the primary productivity um, which give you a better understanding of those effects and those types of simulations require time series data in order to be forced into the model um, so here the ecopath with ecosim model was developed with the same 51 species functional groups as the Atlantis model and they were modeled as biomass pools in tons per kilometer squared. Um, one of the main differences with the way that the functional groups were modeled is the modeling of the bacterial groups which is slightly different from Atlantis which treats the bacterial groups as the same as detrital groups but um, in the ecopath and with ecosim model these effects change um, are slightly different because it there are some um, there are some functional groups that consume bacteria and if you don't have them as their own um, predator prey group um, you don't get those dynamics the diet and prey preferences for this model were based on those used in the, in the Atlantis model, as was the fishing mortality and the initial conditions which we used for the ecopath model, which was at 1959. Um, as Vedette mentioned earlier, the spatial structure for this model was assumed to be um, based on the percentage of the total area that um, functional groups occupy. This was set at 100% of the total study area for all functional groups. Um, this can be changed to a proportion of that particular area, but we can't distinguish between different sub areas and where certain different, where certain functional groups may or may not interact. So this function was not used in this case. Um, a, proxy, a proxy for modeling these kinds of interactions happens when we um, go through the ecosim part where the vul vulnerability of a prey group to predation and the predation searching rates can be set for different groups with and different interactions based on the diet matrix. Um, this diet matrix also um, gives us the ability to have a proxy for migration so there's a proportion of the total diet of a functional group that can be set to being outside the system. Um, Ecopath with Ecosim can include age structure as in the um, Atlantis model, but this wasn't used for this model because um, Ecopath with Ecosim doesn't simulate the interactions between adults and juveniles very well. So for example, if you've got less food or more mortality in juveniles, which would result in less juvenile biomass, the adult population remains unaffected. So um, that doesn't, wasn't helpful in this particular case. So this, this model um, assumes that all the functional groups are adult populations. Um, so I'm gonna pass on to Samic now, who will go through how the size-based model was developed. Yeah, okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Adele. So I'll just give a brief overview. Um, let's see if uh, this works. There we go, brilliant. Okay, so just as a slight bit of background, um, so for this third model, we're using uh, what's known as size spectrum modeling, where um, the size spectrum refers to the um, the abundance of individuals of different body sizes. So um, what we often 
what we often observe um, is that uh, you get consistent behaviors that are related to an organism's body size. So when we're looking at size structured models, we're often looking at species or groups of species and their abundances um, through increasing body size. So rather than focus on species-species uh, interactions, which are what food web mod models generally do, um, we can kind of increase the complexity of this by looking at uh, differing interactions depending on the size that you are. So um, what we're using to do this modeling here is a, uh, um, is a package called MISA, M-I-Z-E-R. So that's a, a freely available uh, package in R. And what it allows for is um, multi-species size spectrum modeling. So for example, if you look at the, the plot on the left-hand side there, you see um, lots of different lines. Uh, each one of those lines represents um, uh, a different species in the, in the model. I should say before I go any further that this, um, the size structure model for Tasmanian Golden Bay was mostly developed by Alice Rogers, who's at Victoria University in Wellington, but um, she's on maternity leave until quite recently. So I just um, took it up and did a, a very small amount of uh, development. So most of this work is definitely uh, you have her to thank. Um, and so what, what Miser allows you to do is to have these uh, multi-species um, models where each of those lines there is a species, and then you can have interactions between the different species, which um, in this case generally means predator prey interactions and so um, for each species we there are a small number of uh, parameters which need to be uh, input um, the, there tend to be fewer parameters needed for this kind of modeling framework compared to atlantis newe so that's um, one of the strengths if you're in a data core system that you, um, perhaps you don't have enough information to develop a, a full-fledged atlantis model something like a size structure model could be um, a kind of simpler alternative um, the, the kind of the flip side of that is obviously that the um, because the information you're providing is generally of a slightly lower resolution, the questions that it can answer can tend to be more limited, which um, Fidette will go on to discuss uh, later on um, in the talk. So, uh, so generally, uh, what you have as species, um, these Mars models, they tend to simulate the species interact with each other and the basic life processes of marine species. So um, growth, death, reproduction, predation, uh, those kinds of processes. So they're always ongoing. Uh, you tend to have, if you look at that left-hand plot, you can see a kind of uh, a green line uh, at the top there. Um, so generally, sorry, I forgot to specify that uh, on that plot, the x-axis there is your body size in grams and the y-axis is some measure of uh, abundance or biomass. And so You've got all the different species there, which are the kind of the, the non-linear lines. Uh, the linear line at the top there is to represent a resource spectrum. So um, we don't explicitly model uh, dynamics of um, things like phytoplankton and zooplankton, but these are uh, assumed to be, they, they can be dynamic, but they're not, um, they're not feeding in a, a size-based way, which is what these other species are. And so they're generally a, a resource that can be fed upon and then are generally um, replenished in some way, such as, such as a hemostat is an often uh, common approach used. And so what we, uh, what we can do with these uh, size structured models, we take, uh, for, as our inputs from the Atlantis model, we take um, things such as um, your, the biomasses that you'd expect for each species. So um, uh, we can try and, if we turn off fishing completely and just allow the speed, allow the, model to run to equilibrium we can then look at the biomass of these different species and try and fit those so that you get similar answers to the atlantis and ewe models um, we also take um, parameters to do with um, prey preference so we use uh, there's good detail in the atlantis model about spatial overlap of different species throughout the study area so we summarize those and basically say if two species are always present in uh, the same area then there's going to be a strong predator prey interaction between them Whereas if you never find them in the same spot, we assume there's not going to be feeding between those two species. That's a, a kind of proxy we used for prey availability. Uh, on top of that, we use um, a body size preference. So each species generally has a, um, a preferred body size that it likes to eat relative to its own body size. Obviously, you don't tend to eat organisms that are larger than you. Um, uh, most uh, Marine, a lot of marine species eat in a kind of by swallowing their prey whole so a lot of it's uh, a function of your gape size the actual area that your mouth is able to feed upon and so uh, using information uh, in the atlantis model of the the different prey species of each individual species 
we can then start to look at the average body size of these different uh, prey and get some kind of idea of what's the kind of um, what's the kind of body size that each species likes to eat and and also a measure of the kind of variation around that so things that are eating a lot of different species that have uh, a lot of different body sizes you expect them to be more generalist and uh, have a bit of a wider feeding preference than something that tends to focus on a smaller number of species that are of a limited body size and so finally what we uh, take from uh, Atlantis we, we can look at the, um, the fishing effort over time which is a uh, uh, spoke about in the previous slide and so the plot on the right there that you can see is just looking at uh, looking at these different species as we turn on um, fishing across the, the time period of uh, 1900 to 2014 I believe this um, this simulation is so um, uh, most of those lines there are kind of flat up until 1900 and then actually up until 1950 a lot of them and then as the as fishing pressure increases we see a decrease in biomass which is what the y-axis is in that in this plot and so as as obviously fishing pressure increases on a species you expect it to go down as it's removed from removed from the water so um that's all i wanted to uh say just as a brief introduction to these size structured uh, multi-species models so I'll, I'll hand control back to to continue the presentation. Thanks, Amy. Um, we need to leave some time for questions. I took a bit too long in the intro, I think. I'll skip through this, these next couple of slides rather quickly and then we'll get on to actually what these models are useful for. So we, uh, we have so far compared all three models under historical fishing so that we can understand how the models respond, whether they respond in a similar way or different. Uh, both at the individual species functional group level and uh, looking at it as an ecosystem as a whole. So just quickly, so some of the species basically respond in a very similar way. Like you can see the mackerels here on the top left, they have a very similar um, decline under heavier fishing. The fishing is represented with the dark blue bars. We have Atlantis as the uh, grey lines. The uh, Ecopath with Ecosim model is the gold coloured lines and the uh, blue lines are for the size-based MISO model. And the Atlantis has some more variability about the lines because um, it's got the within year dynamics. And it's also these runs are from including initialization uncertainty as well, where we have multiple runs starting in, in, in slightly different states. Um, so anyway, we still have the general pictures, for example, mackerels and kahawai, um, are very uh, similar across the three models. Uh, we have, for example, Barracuda down the bottom left is uh, very similar between the Ecopath and Ecosim model and the size-based model, uh, but very flat for the Atlantis model. This, I suspect, because I haven't finished looking into it yet, is uh, possibly due to migration in the Barracuda biomass, um, with them spending more of the population outside of the model domain for the Atlantis model than the other two. Uh, red gunnard is interesting. This is uh, completely different in the Atlantis model to the other two. We have a very um, direct response to the fishing from the uh, ecopath with ecosim and the size-based models where they decline under heavy fishing and then increase when the fishing reduces. Whereas we have obviously a bit more of an ecosystem effect kicking in with the Atlantis model, perhaps either um, to do with food available to the red gunnard. Uh, or a predation release, although I suspect more likely the food availability. This um, feeds through also to their spawning success because if they have more food available, they build up those reserve weights and then they can produce more um, spawning as well. So something else has happened to produce an increase in the biomass for this species under heavier fishing and then they actually decline after that. So we get, uh, by comparing all three models, we get a bit more of an insight into how they're parameterized and how those dynamics are really working. And if we go on to um, looking at the diversity index of all three models, um, interestingly, because I had the feeling when I was looking at uh, the, the individual species group level, the ecopath with ecosim and the size-based models seemed a little bit more similar to each other. But at the um, diversity level, actually, the Atlantis model, which is the black line there, and the Ecopath with Ecosim model, the gold line, are a lot more similar in that they both have an initial increase in diversity under fishing 
followed by a decline, whereas the size-based model only reflects the decline in diversity. So if we go into the um, bit that we're perhaps more interested in going forward is so which of the three models would we most want to use? For which situations? Um, so first of all, if we have three models, which we do in this case, and we can use them all to explore a scenario, even if some of them are using proxies, then it does make sense to use all three. They might highlight slightly different ways in which um, the answers can be explored or slightly different dynamics of the system. So we are in the situation for if we're exploring alternative fishing scenarios, uh, but these are considered by removals. So we can use the all three models to um, increase catches on particular um, species groups or decrease catches or have them uh, alternating at different times, uh, having them all fished at their um, management target levels or at half of those or um, many scenarios around those fishing levels. Uh, so if we wanted to do something like area closures, so that second idea there, fishing scenarios with area closures, we can still do all three models, although if we want it explicitly done, then we've got to have the space aspect of Atlantis. So of course, um, to have anything spatial, we're going to be using proxies in the EcoCastle ecosystem model or the size-based model. Whereas if we wanted to actually uh, look at if we protect a particular area of the bay based on the resources that are there or the habitat that are there or, the, or if it was a nursery ground for a particular species, then we get that spatial resolution through the Atlantis model. If we wanted to uh, explore bycatch scenarios, so uh, this can reflect different types of fishing gear or fishing practices that may uh, have more bycatch mortality or may uh, be able to avoid them. Then the EcoPath with the Ecosystem model is also well set for this, as well as the Atlantis model. Um, if we wanted to bring in the slides based model, we'd probably be needing some sort of proxy again through here, whether it was another uh, fleet that was set up, so it, that it was linked to an existing fleet that could account for that bycatch. If we're wanting to do climate scenarios, so uh, all three models, we can force the primary production and then is explore the flow on effects from that. Uh, so one of the effects that is expected under some of the climate change scenarios is for various parts of the marine systems around the world to either have increased or decreased levels of primary production. Um, so that's one of the scenarios that we can explore, although we would probably want to have uh, an oceanographic model first developed to help inform whether that is likely to be an increase or a decrease in the Tasman Golden Base, uh, and then we can force it at that level. Um, as it happens, the Atlantis model could take those variables directly from the oceanographic model in terms of temperature, salinity, and the water movement and then bring those dynamically up through the primary productivity, which is the last box on this page where we can have that explicitly done in the Atlantis model, whereas it would still need to come in at the primary productivity level for the other two models. And sea temperature we can bring in directly in the eco path with ecosim, ecosim model, um, although I think we still need to somehow link that to the primary production for it to have a flow and effect to the rest of the system. And the Atlantis model, of course, can actually bring in sea surface temperature um, temperature at any depth, actually, and then explore the flow and effects of that to the rest of the system. And finally, before we open the floor up for most of the questions, we have also land-based effects, which Atlantis has been designed specifically to include things like coastal erosion or um, runoffs from the rivers with increased nutrient levels coming into the bays and potentially from, in, from storm events as well, or changes in the sedimentation. Um, so again, we can explore similar scenarios from the other three models, but we'd be coming in likely at the primary production level or perhaps at some forced mortality. Um, and if we were going to be exploring something like that with all three models, then I think the sensible thing would be to explore them first with the Atlantis model, get a feel for those flow and effects, and then you could have a think about how you could, where you could bring that into the other models, and then you can still be exploring 
the flow and effects in the other models from a certain point, and you can understand how they how they develop those dynamics. Um, so just as a summary, these um, take homes before we open up for questions. So, uh, so the models are tools for exploring and understanding. So they're all different. The results are going to be not exactly the same, but they're all going to tell us something about the system of interest. Um, exploring scenarios with more than one model is great if we can do that. Uh, they do take a lot of time to develop and to use as well. So every time we use the model, we're going to first be uh, figuring out what in the model causes the development, causes the results that we're seeing before we can actually decide whether that tells us something about the real world. Um, using proxies is a great way of reflecting a scenario using a simpler model then. You don't always have to build a full Atlantis model to explore everything that from the sun to the market. You can use a simpler model that takes um, a quarter of the time or less even and then still come in at a sensible point that still captures those key dynamics that you're interested in. So thanks to my um, co-speakers, Adele, Samik and Alice for her work on size-based model as well. And now we'll open it up to questions. All right, so if you have a question, you can um, put your hand up um, in the participants pane or and we'll answer it or you can type it into the chat. So we'll leave a few questions for a bit of time for that. All right, Michael, I um, unmuted you, so feel free to go ahead. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think this is probably a question for Samik about the size-based um, model. Samik, I know these kinds of models, they, they can be quite, the coexistence of multiple species can be quite um, sensitive to, to the parameters and the assumptions. I just wondered if you had a feel for what, what's the biggest um, effect on, on coexistence in that particular model. I, know, uh, I noticed you said um, you've got the spatial overlap driving the predator-prey interactions. Do you think that's the main factor or have you got things like stock recruitment relationships in there that, that might be driving that as well? So it's a, yeah, it's a good question, I'd say. Um, so just for a bit of background for other people, my PhD was on um, size structure modeling and I also worked with Mike quite a bit um, in the last 10 years on this work. So I'd say with the, the MISER modeling framework, it's actually coexistence is no longer specifically an issue so as long as you have enough um as long as you have enough of a resource spectrum that doesn't deplete that much then you'll always be able to have um species existing but I, it's having them existing at the right level that seems to be the new kind of i guess the new there's been a paradigm shift and that's now what you want to look at so it's um it's not it's not as difficult as it once was to get multi-species coexisting. I think it's having them exist at the correct, um, at the right kind of relative abundance to each other. And so that's where there are a number of um, kind of unknown parameters that you're not able to measure empirically that you generally need to set at some sensible level, but you do have some freedom around. And so a kind of a bit of the, a bit of the art form for using these Mars models um, for, many people have been working in the field has been kind of the techniques for keeping things biologically plausible and um and close to the observations that you see so i'd, I'd actually say that's the uh, that's the bigger challenge and often um if you often you'll find for some species just um yeah what we've just used spatial overlap as a proxy for predator prey um interactions that's not a dot that's not perfect and um there, are def there will be exceptions to that. So sometimes you'll find that introducing, you can have a species, you can have a, um, a multi-species model, say with five species that is existing and they're all at the right level. And when you introduce the six species, just the, the way it kind of rocks the boat in terms of either the amounts that it's feeding on species or it's being fed upon, you can find that often kind of upsets the apple cart and um, you often have to play around in quite a, not that it's unscientific, but it's, it can be quite a, intuitive process to work out what you can adjust to get something coexisting in a system that was previously balanced so i haven't really answered your question but it's kind of that is those are the kind of difficulties you tend to find i have thank you um, we have a question from dan sinclair 
how well would the different models be able to assess whether systems are nitrogen or phosphorus or silicon or iron limited? Uh, so the Atlantis model tracks all of these. So while the uh, uses nitrogen as its key currency, it also tracks all the other nutrients as well. So we can spit these out um, spatially and temporally. Um, not sure that the other models do use, they're using carbon, I think, but I'll let the other modelers speak to that. So the size-based one uh, just uses, um, uh, well, abundance or biomass, so it doesn't have nutrients in there currently. There are um, people are developing kind of um, add-on modules, and I know some people are interested in specific nutrients, but it will be it'll be a while, I'd say, before kind of all four are as integrated as they clearly are in Atlantis right now. Um, the ecosim model can model changes in nutrients, but I've never personally done that, so I'm not entirely sure what its capabilities are. Thank you, Adele. Uh, does anyone else have any burning questions? All right, Jeff, I will unmute you now. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, can you hear me? Okay, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much, guys. Very, very interesting. Um, I was interested in the, some of the comparisons between the models. And where you get different outputs from, for the same species from the different models, how does one interpret that in terms of um, what the models are telling you? And how can you incorporate that into, into understanding the uncertainty that the different model structures are bringing, bringing to the answers they're telling us? Hey Jeff, how's it going? Thanks for joining in. Um, Fine, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think one of the first things it highlights is that they've been parameterized differently, uh, which is likely to do with either, in this case, either the spatial structure, the temporal structure, or the migration. Um, perhaps also the predator and prey thing. So, uh, for example, the Ecopathical Ecosystem model is based on the adult population, so we're not getting that juvenile dynamic in there. Um, so for using the model, if it was a species uh, group that was of interest or, um, or a component that's likely to be uh, influencing results, uh, or if we want to be diligent for all the differences, um, then I think really uh, teasing out where those differences are coming from, understanding what in the system's bringing it in. And then if we needed to, we could use those lessons. So if the Atlantis model, for example, showed that something, uh, an ecosystem effect was coming in there that the other two models weren't allowing for and perhaps should be because it would be more realistic than adding that in there using some sort of proxy. Or vice versa, if the Atlantis model is getting carried away with an extra um, dynamic that it's brought in there due to the complexity that actually doesn't make sense when we tease it out because uh, something's snuck in there or something that suddenly they're, um, in a, they're mostly in a different part of the, of the base perhaps than they should be and hence they have a slightly different predator prey dynamic. Um, then that could tell us something, highlight something that we need to fix in the Atlantis model and then we could edit that. So um, part of the learning curve, I think if they are uh, unresolved and making it into the results of scenarios, then they do need to be fit into the uncertainty of those results. So if we have, um, similar for a, a stock assessment model would use for fisheries, if we have um, two scenarios that show an increase, one shows an increase or one shows a decrease in biomass and we can't decide which one is more right than the other, then we have to really present on both. All right, so our uh, last call for questions before we wrap up. Oh, and we've just had one come in from Richard. Um, Thank you to the presenters for a great presentations. I agree with that. Um, question, Atlantis can look at changes in sedimentation. Has that been used in conjunction with a sediment source tracing model, e.g. sediments from forestry, native forest, pasture areas? 
<clears throat> sorry, just locating my mute button. Um, I'm not sure if it has been used from the sediment source tracing model. I know that we can uh, force nutrients coming into the model from, say, where the rivers outlet into the model. Um, so we could, in theory, link to something like that. I'm not sure whether it would be coupled, so feeding back to that, although you probably wouldn't need it to be. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that has been done, but there's no reason why it can't be. Hopefully that answers your question, Richard. All right, well, if there are no more questions uh, right now, then we will wrap up. Oh, and Murray has just asked when will the recording of the webinar be hosted. So early next week, I'll put it up on the Sustainable Seas YouTube channel, and I will send around an email letting everyone know that it's up there. So um, thank you all for tuning in and um, everyone take care.